Welcome to A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose, a worldwide web event. A New Earth is sponsored in part by Nature Made Liquid Soft Gel Vitamins, the newest way to fuel your greatness. Hi, everybody. Welcome to class number eight of our New Earth web series with author Eckhart Tolle. Eight means we only have two more to go. Tell all your friends. I'm going to miss it. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to miss it. As we head into these final chapters, it's uh, really gratifying to hear from so many of you who feel that your commitment to this work is making a difference in your lives. I know I feel that way, and I'd like to, again, thank all of the students from around the world who are watching, who are willing to awaken to the deeper meaning of your lives. Um, last week, one of the things uh, that Eckhart said that really struck me, uh, you said that the opposite of death is not life. The opposite of death is birth. Life has no opposite. So I think that's a good place to begin our mom moment of silence. Can we go into silence? Life has no opposite. Life has no opposite and perhaps uh, as we go into the silence to feel yourself to be life rather than a person. A person mm -hmm. uh, is here only for a few years but you are basically life experiencing itself temporarily as this person. As this person, this personality, this yes. ego. But yeah. underlying it, you are life that is eternal. And so when you go into stillness, it's easy to sense that underneath the personality, there is an aliveness, there is a presence, there is a consciousness that is timeless. And that's the life beyond the form of life that you are. So, and that's why it has no opposite. That's right. Because it's forever. Yes. And all the opposites only exist in the world of form. In the world of form. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we go into the silence, into the stillness, let's see if we can just feel that in the background you are live. Or rather, I should say, I am live. I am live. Eternal timeless. So we go into the stillness now and get in touch with that eternal life. How wonderful. How wonderful to be able to get into touch with that. That's the inner space that you're talking about yes. in uh, Chapter 8. Yes. Which is all about the discovery of inner space. That's what we're discussing tonight. Let's start with an overview of what this chapter is about. What is inner space? What you just described? Uh, I don't remember when this term first came to me. It must have been during a talk. I, never, I don't believe I used the term in the power of now. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that most, people, uh, most people's uh, mind is full of stuff, full of one thought after another, full of continuously arising thoughts, mm -hmm. emotions, and the external life is full of things that need doing mm -hmm. one thing after another, one thing after another. So uh, I observed that in many people's lives there seems to be no space. There's only one thing after another, one thought after another, one thing to do after another, one thing to be worried about after another. Mm -hmm. So that I noticed this absence of space in human beings. And really, that inner space or spaciousness is what we could also call the stillness. But mm -hmm. uh, I use different terms because... Uh, any one term limits it. When we talk about stillness, yes, it is stillness, but it's much vaster than just stillness. Right. And vaster than being still. Yes. 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 So it's realizing that within you, there's not only 
objects in your consciousness that continuously arise in your consciousness as sense perceptions. You experience mm -hmm. things, sense mm -hmm. perceptions arise continuously and each sense perception becomes an object in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then thoughts arise continuously and every thought becomes also an object that arises in your consciousness. Now, and this is what most people's lives consist of, continuously objects arising in consciousness, and I call that object consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that is what most people know, and they also know themselves as an object in their consciousness. They have an image of who they are. They have right. certain opinions mm -hmm. about who they are. And so you become an object to yourself, and that is the ego. So most, a mental object, you make yourself into a mental object and then you have a relationship with yourself as a mental object. It's a little bit insane, right. but it's normal. <laughs> so uh, now the, the incredible realization, this is where the spiritual dimension starts. There is no spiritual dimension in object consciousness. consciousness. You can have all kinds of interesting sounding or even religious sounding doctrines. Mm -hmm. If there is no space in you, spaciousness, where suddenly a gap arises in between thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's no spaciousness, then you haven't touched yet the spiritual dimension. And this book, I believe, is helping many people to find that space within. You say on page 227, object consciousness needs to be balanced by space consciousness for sanity to return to our planet and for humanity to fulfill its destiny. The arising of space consciousness is the next stage in the evolution of humanity. Space consciousness, consciousness means that in addition to being conscious of things, which always comes down to sense perceptions, thoughts and emotions, there is an understand, undercurrent of awareness. Awareness implies that you are not only conscious of things, but you're also conscious of being conscious. Yes. That's what you're talking about. Yes, and that's an amazing thing at first. If you just listen to, to being conscious, being conscious, the mind says, what does that mean? You can only, you have to experience what that is to know what it means. Mm -hmm. So to be conscious of being conscious, for example, you can do it by looking at something just if people who haven't had a taste of this yet. Yes. Uh, for example, you look at a flower mm -hmm. and you f you, uh, you're conscious of the, the image, the, what you see, the sense perception. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, can you also be conscious of yourself as the perceiving presence, without which there would be no perception? Correct. And so, and that is the consciousness. So while you look at a flower, I'm saying flower because mm -hmm. natural things can get, in, get you in touch with that dimension more easily. Mm -hmm. While you look at a flower, can you sense yourself as the presence that is looking, that is making the perception possible? And then you have two dimensions. You are conscious of being conscious mm -hmm. and you are conscious of what you are looking at. You live in two worlds at the same time. And that, brings in, that means in the background of your life, there is suddenly a vast but intensely alive peace. You're very, because being conscious of being conscious is very peaceful. That's where the true inner peace arises. So, and that if you don't have that in your life, if you're not able to find that space between the thinking and the perception, 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 if you're not, then, then you lose yourself in, in things. In things. And you in the lose world. yourself in the world yeah. and you lose yourself in your own mind. Mm -hmm. You continuously get drawn into every thought that arises. Yeah, well, one of the things that you, you, I know you met uh, Dr. Jill Boat Taylor today. Yes. And uh, I interviewed her on uh, my radio show, The Soul Series, on XM Radio. And for those of you who have been enjoying um, our webcast with Eckhart Tolle, the Monday following our final webcast, I will have an interview with her uh, on the web. Dr. Jill Boat Taylor is a brain scientist who had had a stroke uh, several years ago, and during the process of having the stroke, in the middle of having the stroke, she uh, lost her left, uh, the left hemisphere of the brain, which was language and the ego and all of that, but the right hemisphere remained conscious yes. and she was aware that she had lost the ego and this sense of losing your mind, 
that you have been talking to us about happened to her, was thrust upon her through the stroke. Yes. Yeah. So I believe what happened to her was what we are talking about. She became conscious of consciousness. She itself. became conscious of consciousness. Yeah. Through the stroke. Yes. And really, that's uh, when we say that, but we express it in language, and language always brings in a kind of duality. When mm -hmm. when I say I become, I'm conscious of consciousness, it sounds as if I were separate from consciousness. Right. This is because of the structure of language. In reality, what's happening is that consciousness, is, which is what I am, it, everyone is conscious in That's essence. Right. Consciousness is becoming conscious of itself. And you don't know that until, uh, and that's why that tape is going around the web of Dr. Jill Bo Taylor. You don't know that until you can quiet the mind enough to know that you are not all of these thoughts that you have in your head. You are not your thoughts, but you are life itself. Yes. That is what she also says yes. in, 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 in her book and, and in her lectures. Yes. Yes. That's a wonderful realization just when it comes to a person for the first time. It's just, wow. Whoa. Uh, and that frees you from a lot of things that before were so heavy. Such a, the world can become such a burden to people and your own mind can become such a burden. It creates so much suffering in people's lives. The, um, if people had to live with somebody who inflicts all that negativity on them that, that they inflict on themselves through their own mind, mm -hmm. they would have left that person a long time ago. But you can't leave your mind. You can only go beyond it. And so being able to be conscious of your consciousness or aware of yourself as a perceiving entity or perceiving presence is really what the true awakening is about. Yes. 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 Yes, that's the awakening to who you are beyond the external appearance. And that is what we, we're doing when we're angry and you, you see your ego flare up and all of that, is to be able to step back and perceive yourself as the consciousness observing yourself as the angry person. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's a, in the background... The space in between that. That's right. And so this, the inner space you're talking about is the space between I am angry, I'm you know, saying all of these things, and then there is, a, there is the other self that is observing that. Yes. Uh, now, if you're angry and if the, the, the presence can be there in the background, right. that, that means there's already, you're already very present because it's not easy to remain present when there's anger because anger has an enormous power. Right. So, but if you're observing it, then you can say, I'm out of control. You know, yes, people have done that. Yes. You can say to yourself, I'm out of control. I need to calm down. Yes. yes. But if you know that you're out of control, you're not completely out of control. That's right. That's right. And, That's right. Uh, so, and if, so if you know that you are, be, have been taken over by anger, you haven't been completely taken over because there's a knowing in the background. Yeah. And I think a lot of parents have experienced this, you know, when your kids do something and it's so upsetting to you and you know in that moment I should not try to discipline them because I'm too angry to discipline yes. them. Yes. That part of you that knows that you're too angry to discipline them is the space that you're talking yes. about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got that. And so and that's uh if you don't have that space then you're completely controlled then, by the anger, you that's become right. the anger. That's right. That thing that allows you to step back is yes. what you're talking about. Yes. I got it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. That part of you that says, I can step back and see I'm acting a fool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you, if you know that you are acting a fool, then it's not, there is a sanity there that's observing yeah. the insanity. Uh-huh. And if you know that you are... But sometimes people know they're acting a fool and they just keep on acting a fool. Yes, that's yeah. possible too. Yeah. For a while, it can happen that the old, certain old behavior patterns. But generally, if you know, you can pull yourself back. Yes, yes. Um, and that which knows is the inner space that you're talking about. Yes, there was a film, The a Beautiful Mind, some years ago yes, yes, yes. about the scientist. With Russell Crowe. Yes, mm -hmm. and so here uh, he became delusional. Uh, this scientist, uh, completely absorbed by his mind and had all kinds of delusions. Mm -hmm. And at some point in the middle of the film, he suddenly realizes that these are delusions and he realizes that he's insane. Mm -hmm. And also the viewer at that moment realizes it's so well done because until that point, even the viewer doesn't know He's not that. quite sure, yes. And, and at that moment, the healing begins because with the realization that I am insane, 
the sanity has arisen, the observing presence is there. The observing presence. And after that, he could function again. Is observing presence and inner space the same thing? Yes, but observing should not be confused with judging. I got it. So there's no judgment. It's a, it's a clear, it's like a mirror. It's That's like right. a mirror showing you what's there. Mm -hmm. So there are literally two dimensions. There is the personality acting out of, you know, form and perceptions and all of that. And then there is the observer of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the observer is not judging what is being observed. If the observer begins is. to judge, then it's the mind that has come back in. Okay. It just is. Mm -hmm. And the observer is timeless, and whatever the observer is observing, the behavior, mm -hmm. the thinking, is conditioned by the past. Mm -hmm. So you're bringing a, the timeless dimension into this world of mm -hmm. time. Yes. And uh, those of you who are <coughs> reading uh, Jill Bo, Dr. Jill Bo Taylor's uh, book, uh, stroke of insight where she she she, she said to me today because she's been following our classes and she was saying you know what Eckhart calls consciousness I call right brain yes yeah right brain versus left yes. left brain yes. left brain is gone the right brain is the higher consciousness yes yes that's right. so as I've said before I love the message boards on uh, Oprah.com and I saw a posting that I wanted to share with everyone it's from someone who calls themselves student 99 it said, I've seen many, many posts by concerned Christians. Uh, is student 99 here? I thought we had him. I, I heard he was on Skype. Well, I don't mean here, here, Dean. I know he's not in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Bring up student 99. Um, so student 99, is that you? Yeah. Hi, on Skype. I love this email. I love the... I love the fact that you have a face and a body and everything, because you just were an entity on the web to me, posted by Student99 that says, I have seen many posts by concerned Christians wondering whether this book is a threat to their faith. And you said, as a Christian, you don't think it is, and here is why. You want to tell us why? Because I, I thought this was such a beautiful email, and you know I've gotten some flack from um, some Christians. Uh, I've even been called the Antichrist, which is <laughs> kind of amused by that, uh, for introducing this book to the world. So I was interested in hearing what you had to say. Student 99, whose name is really Alan from Eugene, Oregon. Hi, Alan. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hello. Hi. You well, said... You know, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, you go ahead. So I'm going to let you tell me what you said in the email. Well, basically, um, you know, I observed some people that were posting that were in a lot of distress and because they felt that the book uh, was an attack on their faith, uh, many of them had not read the book. Yeah, and I so that. I wanted to just provide a little bit of perspective on that. Uh, from my perspective, I felt like Eckhart's book allowed me to, uh, to do more than just quote what Jesus said and to actually understand the depth of what he was teaching and be able to practice what he taught rather than just quote what he taught. Well, let me read so, what you said specifically because I thought you said it so beautifully here. Most Christians understand the concepts from the Bible of surrendering their lives to God and living a loving life and living in the peace that passes understanding. Christians can quote Jesus as saying such as be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect or judge not that you be not judged or you must die to live or deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Unfortunately, not all Christians have succeeded in following up the talk with the walk. This is because these quotes point to an internal transformation, which some Christians have not yet fully experienced. That is why I strongly recommend this book, you said, Alan. It provides for very powerful tools for being able to successfully Follow Jesus' teachings rather than just quoting them. The book doesn't ask anyone to change their religion of choice, but does help tremendously in successfully applying faith. In a nutshell, you say, Alan, the book shows how to apply forgiveness to every person and every situation. It shows how to shine the light of awareness on our unconscious hatred of this moment and thereby overcome the cares of this world. If you want to go deeper than knowing about God at the level of thoughts, and experience God at the level of knowing, I welcome you to join us in reading A New Earth. Blessings from Student 99. Isn't that yes. well said, Eckhart? Oh, yes, wonderful, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Alan, thank you for that. Sure, and, and you know, 
I had left the church and I ended up being able to return to church because of uh, understanding how to apply the concepts in this book. Really? Well, that's good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I don't read all the negative stuff, though, because it doesn't help me. So I'm only, no, I I'm only you know, I'm only interested in speaking to people who want to hear what we have to say. And if you don't agree with what I'm saying, that's really okay. I bless everybody in their path, whatever that is. Yes. Yeah. And I've had letters from some priests who found and nuns and Buddhist monks, and they all they found the book very helpful. They mm -hmm. went more deeply into their own tradition. Mm -hmm. Because when you go deep enough into your own tradition, eventually, every, all traditions, eventually you end up in the same place, the same realization. Mm -hmm. On the surface, the traditions are different. Yeah. There's only one God at the center. Right. Mm -hmm. There is only one God. I believe that. The source of all things, all creation. Yes. So Peter is Skyping us from his dining room in Phoenix, Arizona. I love to see where people are. Is that a green dining? Is that green? Yes, it is. That's my favorite color. My gosh, that's oh. such a lovely color. Hi. Uh, Peter uh, we're, is Skyping us from his dining room in Phoenix, where he and a group of friends gather every Monday night to watch our live webcasts. I think that's so great. I hear you adopted a dog and named it Oprah. Is that true? <laughs> Come on, Oprah. Come on. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, she came to us the first night of the webcast. Um, you know, the, the system went down, so it crashed. So we had all the people gathered. Uh -huh. And she came into my life oh. that night. Wow. And, uh, oh, what a <laughs> cutie pie. <And> I, <laughs> she's holding up so the she's name. A, you're just my family. That's so great. That's really great. You, you say you were addicted to smoking for 30 years, but quit 11 weeks ago after reading A New Earth. How, 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 this ties into your question, correct? Exactly. Um, we started our group four weeks before the um, actual web class, and we were reading the chapter on, on number eight. So I applied the techniques to quitting smoking, and it was about five minutes' work, and about, you know, about three hours' time, I had completely stopped. No urges, no more cravings, nothing. No willpower, anything like that. It was so easy. It was amazing. What, did, what is it that you applied? Um, becoming conscious of the feelings. Uh, I had run out of the cigarettes and I thought I had to go to the store, but when the craving came, I said, okay, let's be with the craving, let's feel it. What does it actually feel like? Usually we just react. And I actually sat there and closed my eyes and felt it, and it started to dissolve, and it went away. And about two or three hours later, another craving came, and I did the same thing, and this time the, the feeling went away even faster. And then finally, when it came back about a third time, when I put my mind to it, it just completely disappeared. Wow. Gone, never came back. So, were you also doing? I think Eckhart suggests in the addiction uh, section, take, taking deep breaths sometimes when you feel like you need the craving for whether it's cigarettes or food or whatever, to, to take the three deep breaths and see what happens if it, if the feeling dissipates. Did you do that? Yes, I did. I took the breaths to basically uh, create stillness, to become calm. Mm -hmm. So I took long deep breaths and just sort of calmed down, and then just started to feel the feelings and watch and watch the thoughts. And I, you know, I've tried to quit you know, hundreds of times, and sometimes a couple of months successfully, but there was always willpower involved, and there was always a craving still there. There was always that, you know, if I just had one, that was always still in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. That's no longer there. I can go out with my friends on a Friday night, and they can all be smoking, and I won't even, I only want to look at one. What in the world happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> it was miraculous. Yes, that's great. Yeah. And have yeah. you been able to apply the... Um, the teachings from the book and other areas of your life. I mean, for myself, I've just found that being able to go back to my breath in the middle of the day when things get crazier. I mean, something Eckhart said, I think, on one of the beginning classes about one complete full breath is a meditation. Mm. Well, that's where the question one comes because breath. I do have other one issues. One conscious breath is a meditation. Uh, earlier in the book, and in the chapter, he talks about going below thought. Yes. And he described my situation exactly like he's, like he's here. Um, we talk about um, you know, alcohol, using food and TV to, to go below thoughts, sort of to numb the senses, numb your thoughts, and just sort of go into uh, trance, if you will. And I do that a lot. And I've been trying to break away from that by using the techniques. I, I have not had the same success. And you also say, don't make it a problem. But I think I made it a problem, and I want to kind of break from that. So you're, 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 are you, is, you're, you're asking a question about how to use this more yeah. forcefully or whatever, 
to yeah. for alcohol? Yeah, with alcohol especially and, and food. You know, I tend to overeat when I'm tired and I'm and I just want to relax. Food, alcohol, TV tend to be the the things I use, and that that brings you below thought when when we're trying to be above thought. Right. And when I try and do that, I'm not as successful. I, I get very frustrated. Okay. What do you want to say, Eckhart? Well, it's uh, your wonderful success story as far as the smoking is concerned, mm -hmm. and bringing, uh, experiencing how awareness can dissolve old patterns. In some cases, instantly. Uh, and in other cases, it takes more time for awareness to dissolve the old pattern, and awareness has to be brought to the pattern when it arises repeatedly. And it does not mean that every time awareness meets the pattern, that uh, awareness is going to win. Um, win it may not be the right word, because awareness, of course, is not never fighting anything. Awareness mm. is just there as the, the conscious presence. But so bringing conscious presence, for example, into the urge to have a drink, uh, not that one or two drinks are a problem, but if drinking is, uh, uh, drags you down, drags you down to a, a below thinking, mm -hmm. then of course uh, it is helpful to bring presence into the urge when it arises. In the same way that you did when you uh, felt the urge come upon you to smoke. Mm -hmm. So have you practiced that? Have you been able to feel the urge to drink and then bring awareness to that? And what happened? Yes, I have. And it's, it, it, it kind of postpones it. Eventually, I kind of break down. Yes. I believe I mentioned in the book that uh, bring awareness to it. And it may well happen that the uh, desire, the urge, is still there after 10 minutes of awareness. Mm -hmm. I believe I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that uh, uh, you have lost. It means that the, the desire is very strong. And at that point, perhaps you will have a drink. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens again, you bring awareness to it again. Eventually, something will happen to the pattern. Uh, it's, uh, it's very rare to have an instant success as you did with smoking. It does happen in some cases. But mm -hmm. bring awareness to old patterns, whatever it is, addictive patterns, behavior patterns. Bring awareness, and eventually they cannot coexist for that long. So it's a continuing practice. But don't expect perfection. Don't expect you to be the perfect human being who never Right. touches a drink again or whatever. Uh, as I said to Oprah, I enjoy a drink occasionally. And so. I said, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you saying also, and you, you, you said this in the beginning, Peter, don't judge it. And as you begin to practice, what I hear you saying yes. is this miracle that you experience with cigarettes is just that, because it rarely happens that you start this one time and it works immediately. What you're saying is the more you apply the practice of bringing consciousness to this desire or craving, to this yes. craving, that it will it will gradually lessen. Yes. It will lessen. It will it yes. will weaken. It yes. will weaken. Yes. Uh, you can also apply it to other things like the uh, many people are addicted to television. They, uh, one day without watching TV would be dreadful for them. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it, you could perhaps. Uh, as a practice, like a spiritual practice, you could say, one day a week, I'll see what happens if I don't watch television. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, don't do it when the Oprah show is on. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. One day a week, I'll practice and then observe inside yourself what it feels like, what the, the need to switch on, the need to be entertained, the need to be stimulated, to absorb what's on the screen. Mm -hmm. So one day practice. Thank you so much, Peter. Those are friends behind you? Yes, they're my readers. My hi. hi. <laughs> Peter, move out of the way so we can see them, so we can say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> hi, hi to Peter's group. That's so great there in Phoenix. <laughs> Yay, guys. Thank you for watching. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, all the best to Oprah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oprah is very cute. Oprah is very cute. <laughs> oh, we're talking about the dog. <laughs> okay, we've got Eric on the line calling from uh, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. Eric, what's your question? Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hi. 
Hi. Uh, uh, my question is um, in reference to page 224 when Eckhart writes the phrase, this too shall pass. Oh, yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah and I, I feel it's a real powerful phrase that uh, brings a person into the present moment. And yes. it's also used as a slogan in 12-step recovery programs. And um, when someone's been living very much in the ego and form surrenders and enters a 12-step program, um, which I did over five years ago, and I currently act as a sponsor for newcomers. Um, am I acting too much in the ego because I'm constantly working these 12 steps and sharing them and your concepts with others? And also, if this is the case, um, how can I live in consciousness and work at 12-step programs with the meetings and sponsorship without the ego being so much at the forefront? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. The the criterion is whether you yourself are still living it on a daily basis. If you're living the truth of it, this too shall pass is only a pointer towards a particular state of consciousness that is a state of detachment. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you don't care, but it's a state of you still care deeply, but there's not, there is a detachment from what's happening, an inner sense of freedom in the background. So when you use these tools, for example, a phrase or a pointer, sometimes people who teach these things professionally, after a while they stop practicing themselves and mm -hmm. they, just, they just use them as a formal thing. Mm -hmm. And then the ego can come back in. Because you think you know everything. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then you are not living it, you're teaching it, but you're not yourself living it anymore. And that is the question that only you can answer whether you are still living the reality that's beyond this pointer, that what the pointer points to, and if you are living it, the ego has not taken over and you're doing wonderful and very helpful work. I know that the 12-step program has been extremely helpful for many people. I've yes. had many people who've come to spirituality through that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're doing wonderful work and continue to be alert and awake so that there's a certain amount of self-observation just to make sure that you are still there yourself, that you come from that place mm -hmm. so that the mind doesn't take over. Okay, Eric? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. So let's begin because I think that's one of uh, a huge part of Chapter 8 uh, in the discovery of inner space. The story that you began with the ancient Sufi story from the Middle East about a king who's continuously torn between happiness and depression. On page 223, you write, the slightest thing would cause him great upset or provoke an intense reaction, and his happiness would quickly turn into disappointment and despair. A time came when the king finally got tired of himself and of life, began to seek a way out. He sent for a wise man who lived in his kingdom who was reputed to be enlightened. And when the wise man came, the king said to him, I want to be like you. Can you give me something that will bring balance, serenity, and wisdom into my life? I will pay any price you ask. And what is that price the king had to pay? What is the price all of us have to pay? Well, first of all, of course, the, the price, uh, the king asked, well, how, how much does it cost? How much mm -hmm. is it going to cost? And the wise man said to him, it is so of such value that even your whole kingdom could not pay for mm -hmm. it. Now, what that means is that the primary thing in your life is nothing external. What is primary in your life is your inner state of consciousness. I got that. And compared to that, you could have the greatest riches if you are in a state of anxiety or fear, negativity, Nothing is worth that. You know, in the Bible and in the church, they, they, I don't know if it's in the Bible, but I know in the church we sing this song called, It is well with my soul. Yes. So unless it is well with your soul, it does not matter what your outward state is, where you're living, how, big, how many square feet you have, how many cars, whatever acclaim you have received in the world, unless it is well with your soul yes. or your inner state of yes. being, yes. your inner space, then you're not well. Yes. And so that's the, uh, 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 always to bear that in mind. Yes. What is, my, am I at one with life at this moment? Mm -hmm. What is my inner state at this moment? Mm -hmm. Your primary concern in any situation needs to be your inner state. Your secondary concern is the outer situation. Mm -hmm. Because only when you're in an inner state of 
rightness of presence mm -hmm. can you uh, adequately deal with outer situations. So what is the price? There is no price in terms of monetary value right. or anything like that. We could say that the price to pay is uh, you let go of the false self. That is the price you pay. Mm -hmm. The false mind-made self. The price to pay is identification with that false, eaten, the false I, the mm -hmm. false me. Mm -hmm. And so that's a relatively easy price to pay because it's wonderful to let go of that. But the wise man gives the king a ring. Yes. And inside the ring, the inscription is... This too shall pass. This too shall pass. And he says, whatever situation arises in your life, before you call it good or bad, before you react, before you judge it, touch this ring and remember the inscription. That you, and this is this too shall pass. Now, I find that to be very helpful. As a matter of fact, when I was going through last year this crisis at my school, that was one of the things I said to myself every day is live in this moment, let's handle this moment as it comes, and this moment as it comes, and then what comes next, I'll handle that moment. And I always knew this too shall pass. Works for me very well, and I'm sure a lot of other people, if you're in a difficult t stage in your life, you're going through, uh, you know, trauma or divorce or whatever to know that this too shall pass but when I'm feeling happy uh, and feeling joyful I don't want to think this too shall pass uh, that can actually also be very peaceful if you know that it is transient I know no, but that you're having such a good time and then you're thinking this too shall pass so don't get too happy if you don't know that this too shall pass then what can happen? You will cling to the situation internally. I got, it. I got that. And if you cling to the situation and then it passes, as it will. As it will. Or even if it doesn't pass yet, it might last for a little while, even while you are the clinging itself means already some fear is coming in. Oh, I see that. Through the holding on, you don't want this situation to leave you, or you don't want to leave the situation. Mm -hmm. The clinging means brings already up some fear and that means you can't, you can't enjoy oh, it as much, really. I just had a great epiphany, not even for myself, but for all the people that I know that are, the word, key word here is clinging. So many people do this in relationships. They're holding on to a relationship that has already shown itself to be transient. It's moving on yeah. to the next level. Yes. And what so many people do, they want to hold on and let it be as it always was. Yes. And it's in the process of passing. Yes and you should let it pass. Yes, allowing change to happen mm -hmm. and becoming comfortable with change. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of this, this too shall pass because we live in this world where things continuously pass away. Mm -hmm. the, the Buddhists call it impermanence. It's mm -hmm. one of the deepest truths of the Buddha. And, and, and the, the problem lies when you expect it to be the same as it always was and that's where so many people get in trouble in their relationships especially. Yes. And it's an inability to let go, mm -hmm. inability to let go of, of situations, of people, and uh, that eventually brings suffering. Yeah, just recently a friend of mine was telling me about her husband had said to her, he wasn't sure he wanted to remain in the relationship. He wasn't sure, and they're, you know, seeking counseling about that, and he's now, you know, sleeping in a different bedroom and all that stuff. And she's trying to hold on and wants things to be the way they were and wants to have a baby and all of that. And you would say, put that ring on. Yes. <laughs> uh, so do, especially don't cling. If you don't cling, it means there's no fear in the situation. The That's fear right. comes through the clinging, through mm -hmm. not wanting the change. Mm -hmm. And so if you approach the situation without fear, then mm -hmm. one of two things can happen in a situation like this. Mm -hmm there may become a deepening in the relationship. When a relationship hits a crisis, mm -hmm. it may be time for the relationship to dissolve or it may be time for a deepening. Uh -huh. And so... How do you uh, know the difference? When there's no fear, then you will know either it will deepen or it will end. Wow, or it will pass on. The fear keeps you stuck where you are. In got it. Mm. I got it. So let's see some of the email questions you've been sending during our class. Um, Linda in Tokyo, Japan. How do I tell the difference between an ego decision or a conscious decision? I'm in a sexless marriage and want to leave. Oh. 
I'm scared. I've been living in the moment for the past eight weeks. My, my answer is not coming to me. That's Good. what Linda wants to know. Oh, How yes. do I tell the difference between an ego decision or a conscious decision? Yes. I'm in a sexless That's marriage it. and I want to leave, I'm, but I'm scared. Good you just question. said it. You just said it. Though. Yes. And uh, an additional thing here, the sometimes uh, uh, something comes to you, this is what I'm going to do, your mind says. Okay, now I know what I have to do. The question is, what, where does that realization of what you have to do come from? Does it come from the ego? I think, or does it come from the deeper level of your being? How can I tell the difference? Mm -hmm. There's a qualitative difference, a difference in, one could say, vibrational frequency. Correct. If it comes from the deeper level of yourself, out of the stillness, it's always associated with peace. There yes. Is a peace. It's a peaceful Absolutely. realization. Absolutely. If it's agitated or if it's fearful and says, now I know what I have to do, or if it's angry, agitated, fearful, it comes from the upper level. And another thing I would say to Linda in Tokyo, you know, Japan, you're absolutely correct. Another thing, it comes from, if it's coming from inner space that we're talking about in chapter eight, if it's coming from consciousness or inner space and not your ego, not only will you feel peace, but you won't have to ask 15 other people, is it the right thing? Yes. You will know it's the right thing. Yes. You will know it's the right thing. Yes. And I have found that if you are operating from consciousness, your higher consciousness, or as we're calling it in this chapter, inner space, that you, it, whether it's buying a pair of shoes or making a life decision, if it comes from the place of inner space, you know the answer. When it's outside yourself, if it's in your ego mind, you have to ask the store clerk, you have to ask your friends, you have to ask everybody, yes. what do you think, what do you think, what do you think of these shoes, what do you think, what do you think, you know? Uh, yes. But when you are, when it's well with your soul, the answer is clear. Yes. That's, that's how a, you know. Quiet, peaceful certainty. Yes. Powerful, quiet, peaceful. You know what you have to do. You know what's right for you. Mm-hmm. It's like the other day I had to uh, cancel an engagement and I was saying I never cancel things. But after I canceled, I felt such a calm yeah. and I knew that that was the right decision. Yes. Although it might be upsetting to other people, I felt such a calmness about it. And that is true for anybody who's making a decision. When you make the right decision, you feel a calmness and a peace about it. Yes. And that also relationships, leaving a relationship, if it comes from the right place, you're you leave, but you're peaceful. Right. Yes. Yeah. You're not afraid. No. You're not afraid. No. You still could be sad about it, though. Yes. Yes. Sadness can happen. You, you could be sad about it. Disappointed about it. The interesting thing about sadness is, or sadness, of course, also rises when somebody passes away, right. close to you. There can be sadness, and uh, if there's acceptance, then because death is one of the prime examples of everything passing away, right. every for life form passes away. Everybody, if you live with a partner, mm -hmm. either the, your partner will leave you or you will leave mm -hmm. sooner or later mm -hmm. through death. Uh, so that's the allowing change to happen. Allowing change to happen. And you say the key to understanding this too will pass at the top of page 225 is knowing that non-resistance, not resisting, non-judgment and non-attachment are the three aspects of true freedom and enlightened living. Hard to be non-resistant, non-judgmental and non-attached when it's your husband who says, I don't longer want to be in this relationship. Yes, yes. And if, there's a, if you share a, a great deal of past with another person, it could also be a family member mm -hmm. and so a parent then it's sometimes harder to be present when there's a huge amount of past in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I got that. But once you see and accept the transience of all things, page 225, and the inevitability of change, you can enjoy the pleasures of the world while they, while they last without fear of loss or anxiety about the future. Yes. I thought that was such, so brilliant the way you did that. That's the beautiful thing about being enjoy, able to enjoy the things of this world, knowing that it's, nothing is going to last. Nothing's going to last. And you can actually enjoy it more deeply now without the fear that it might finish. Because it is going to finish. Yes, yes.
It and, is and going then to something else will take its place. It's okay. continuous coming and going. I got that. Tonight we're mm. Skyping again with a study group in Los Angeles who've gathered, gathered at the Bodhi Tree bookstore. It's a landmark in West Hollywood. Hi, everybody at the Bodhi Tree. Hi. Hi. Oh, gosh. Our, there's our Bodhi, Bodhi followers. Nick has a question about finding his purpose, and I know it's something that's been on the minds of quite a few of our students. Hello, Nick. Let's hear it. Yeah, hey, Oprah. What's up? Hey, <laughs> everything's um, up. <laughs> my question is basically, um, well, you have to worry about a lot of stuff in life. You have to go to work. You have to pay your bill. Uh, your cell phone bill works in the now, but if you don't work today, it's not going to work a month from today. So how do you live in the now and still worry about your IRAs, investing in your future, uh, what you're going to do as far as, you know, money, paying your bills, doing what you have to do, you know, in this ego-centered world, especially in Los Angeles. So, <laughs> that's, so that's, what you're yes, saying is, is what, what if, how is, does becoming who we are truly, uh, what if becoming who we were, were truly meant to be really isn't financially practical is what you're asking, right? Uh, yeah, what if I wanted to go on a mountain somewhere and just become who I was? I, I, I eventually would, I guess, starve or <laughs> freeze, but, um, I mean, you know, it, how do you integrate this in your everyday life, sort of being in the now, being the essence of who you are, yeah. um, without, without suffering in the long run? Without, you know, the squirrel would suffer, the squirrel would die if it didn't put away nuts for the future, so... Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I, I'd seen a question that you'd sent earlier, Nick, where you said it's all fine and dandy to read about becoming who you truly are and being who you were meant to be, but how do we do that and still pay all of our bills? Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. However, the question, uh, the first few words of your question already contained an error, and it's easy. If an error keeps into a question, then it's hard to answer it truly. The error was you said we have to worry about paying our bills and all kinds of things. Is that true? No. You have to pay your bills, but you don't have to worry about paying your bills. And the squirrel has to put away the nuts, but the squirrel is not worried about the nuts. Only humans are worried about their nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so uh, you can, being present with what you do does not mean that you neglect your daily affairs mm -hmm. and so on. It means you deal with them in a different and, in fact, more powerful and more effective way. You give up the worrying part. You still pay your bills, but you let go of the worrying about paying your bills. In that way, you learn from the squirrel how to live. Because worrying is your choice. You see that, don't you, Nick? No, you worrying is your Sometimes choice. It, at times when I don't worry, um, I, I've had moments in my life where I didn't worry. I just kind of let the, the waves of the world roll over me. And I kind of did nothing about situations and hoped that they would work out themselves. And they didn't. I mean, it, you know, wor worrying did help me in the past to actually get things together and get my life on track. Um, I guess to be, for me in my life, to be in the essence, to be with my spiritual self, it doesn't, it's not enough. I have to really be actively worried about the actual day-to-day -day business of surviving, well, you know, I which would, most people have to do, you know. I would still argue with that. This, it is true that you need to take action. It is not true that you need to worry in all, order to be able to take action. Uh, so you can actually experiment with, in your daily life, start with little situations. Let's say there's a pile of bills that you have to pay. How, how do you approach these bills? Are you going to worry the night before or on the day? Or the, am I going to be able to pay you? You just take one bill after another, you look at it, you face it. Okay, do I have the money in my bank account or not? If you don't have the money in my bank account, I have to do something to make more money. What is the possible, what can I do now? Put that aside, look, this action I can take. Pick up the phone, make a phone call. Do the present, effective, powerful, but no worry. If you, then, then you'll see all, your whole life will become not only more effective and more powerful, but also much easier. It flows with greater ease. Nothing in nature is worried. All the animals do what they have to do, but they don't worry about it. They are active. Everything is active in nature. The trees are active, the grass, the flowers. Everything is active and putting out energy 
It's only the hum humans that worry about it and think they need worry in order to survive in this world. You don't need worry, you need action, but yeah. not worry. That's an interesting point. If you've ever been on safari or seen animals on a hunt or actually seen a kill, you know, they go out in search of, and we've, everybody, I'm sure, watched the Planet Earth. You watched the Planet Earth series, right, series, right Nick, where you see the animals? No. Oh, no, Nick, but you got you know it. know what? <laughs> what he was saying, I'm sorry. Nick, you've got to get the Planet the Earth. <laughs> And you get to see all these animals hunting other animals, and I just, it just, just made me think of what you're saying. As the animal's hunting the other animal, it's just doing it. It's not worrying, I hope I find a rabbit today. I hope I find a rabbit today. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. You, you want to continue? That, yeah. That reminds me of the lily in the valley. That it doesn't worry about clothing itself in the Bible. Um, it just does. It just exists. Um, it, it worries not whether the, the sparrow or the crow does not worry how it's going to get its yes. next meal. Yes. It just, yes. it just does. Yes. And that reminds yes. me of that yes. right there. Yes. But I, I'm, I'm thinking, I guess I'm thinking of those hippies in India that still haven't come back. <laughs> they're just, they're just broke and yeah, yeah. They took all their saying, idealism that's, there. Nick is saying, well, that's really good for that Bible stuff and for the lilies of the valley. But listen, I'm living in LA and uh, I got to worry right, about right, this. Really. Is there anybody else uh, there at the Bodhi uh, tree behind you that, uh, is thanks. there anybody that disagrees with Nick that has, you know, similar issues and you're not worried about it? You've been able to apply. Come up to the microphone here. Let's get, <laughs> hey, come on up there. <laughs> hi. Hi. Hi, you How are. are you? Hi, who are you? I'm Jessica. Oh, hi, Jessica. Hi. So what do you want to say about what we've been talking about? Um, you know, there's a, it's on page 238, and it's um, about becoming one with the situation and that the solution arises out of that. Uh -huh. And um, I've always kind of been a more of a take action person first and then deal with the inner peace and all that later. But um, I was wondering, how do you deal with things like that in relationships and things like weight management and all of those issues? Do you just become still and just hope for an answer to come, or do you still actively seek one out? Uh, so what you're referring to is uh, on this page it says in, you don't react. What I'm saying there is you don't react against a situation when a situation arises that... Uh, you merge with it. Yes. And you the become, solution rises out of the situation. Yes. Yeah. Now, this should not be confused with becoming inactive or just sitting there and looking and not doing anything. What it means is there is no inner resistance to that arising situation. Sometimes uh, things happen when you have a project, you have some work to do, and something happens to, some obstacle arises in what you want to do. A person, a situation arises. And so for many people, as soon as an obstacle arises, they become resistant and they go into a negative state and try to fight the obstacle. They're fighting the obstacle rather than accepting the moment as it is internally. You say, oh, the right. situation has changed. We talked about change. Right. Situations change continuously and the world does not necessarily do what it wants you to do, what you want it to do. So you face a situation and any change that happens is immediately accepted inside and through the acceptance you respond to the situation. So you're not accusing, you're not making wrong, mm -hmm. you're not complaining about the situation to yourself and others. So many people burn up a huge, huge amount of energy uselessly that they could use to deal with the situation, but they burn up a huge amount of energy complaining in their heads and to others about what has happened. Right. Instead of looking at what has happened and saying, oh, this is how it is, what can I do now? A moment of stillness and then action happens. No complaining, no resisting, no fighting against, not making a person or situation into an enemy that again burns up a lot of useless energy and brings up a lot of energy that is going to sabotage what you want to do. So, uh, again, you say, when instead of reacting against the situation, you merge with it, the solution arises out of the situation itself. Actually, it's not you, the person who's looking and listening, but the alert stillness itself or yes. the inner space. When I say the solution arises out of the situation, it does not mean that you don't do anything. In some cases, it is you 
who is going to take the action, but it will come out of a powerful place of being one with the situation. Yeah, I, I, I think, too, Jessica, ask Nick to come back to the microphone. Thanks, Jessica. Nick, come back up here. We're not through with you. I, I, I think, too, I think you really represent a whole lot of people, particularly young people, who have said to me personally or have emailed uh, and think that um, being uh, in alignment with who you're truly meant to be and awakening to your purpose is some kind of, is, uh, represents passivity, that you're just sort of sitting around, just, you know, waiting on a woo-hoo <clears throat> moment and not really doing anything. The real purpose of this entire book and the work of spirituality is to get you, to get us to align our personalities with our soul or higher consciousness so that the work that you do in the world comes from the place of the higher consciousness and you use your ego or personality to serve that. You allow your personality to serve the calling of consciousness that has put you here on the earth in the first place. And when you do that, everything has a flow to it. You're in the right job that gives you the right amount of money for you at any given time because you are in alignment. So you're not worrying about things because you're not living beyond your means. You're not stressing about things because you're not allowing your ego to determine and define who you are in the world. So you're not acting out of an external self, but acting out of the place of inner space or consciousness so everything is in alignment. And that's not passive. That's not, woo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, I can't pay my bills, and so let me find myself later. That is aligning your personality with the higher consciousness so that your higher consciousness, you operate from a place of being, and the, the inner space is directing and guiding your life and not the outer space. You get it? Um, yeah, I do. I, I, sorry if I made you mad over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, I do. I, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> no, I'm not mad, but I just, I, I hear this, I hear this a lot. I mean, earlier today, my stylist was saying, well, what about my passion? What about, what about my passion? You want me to just give up my passion? No, this isn't about giving up your passion. It's about feeling your passion more deeply. Yes. Yes. And being in alignment with that. How do you know if you, what you want, what your passion is, isn't just ego driven? What if I just wanted to be like, I don't know, a rock star and that's just completely ego driven and that didn't help the world in any way. But if I kept on working towards it, um, it would just, it would just not be serving anyone but myself. How, what if my passion is wrong? You know, what if, if it's sorry, wrong. too many questions. No, 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 no it's no, fine. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Eckhart, <laughs> answer that. Uh, sometimes you may not know until you have achieved what you wanted to achieve, whether it was ego or not. When you get what you wanted to achieve, and very soon you fi fi find it does not satisfy you, then it was the ego. So you can, this is a learning process. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's saying you shouldn't try to achieve this or that. If the, the impulse is there to have this or that, do it mm -hmm. and see what happens. If it doesn't satisfy you, it's the ego. <laughs> and the greatest rock stars are those who, who, who are rock stars because they sing, they sing or they perform because they had to. And whether they were performing to, you know, grand crowds or in their garage mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. to just their family members, they sing because they have to. The greatest yes. dancers are those who dance because they have to and they become rock stars or dancing stars because that is coming from such a pure place of, of, of passion. And that's what the world feels, because those are the people who last. Yes. The people who are operating from the passionate, true space. Yes. And not just doing it because they want to make the money or because of the ego self. Yes. That's what I think. Very good. But it's nice that's talking to you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry it took so long, but it was a pleasure to Thanks, be here. everybody Thank at the you. Bodhi Tree. Jessica, okay. Nick, and all, the, all our Bodhi buddies there. <laughs> okay, now we have an email from Sumaya in Bethlehem. Uh, who wanted to say that I live under military occupation, I've witnessed the demolishing of my home, and I do not know how to apply your theories when the outside is so out of my control. How can I be at peace when there are soldiers outside my door? There's a question for you. 
That is, of course, the experience of many people in this world. If you look what's happening in this world, people are confronted with violence all the time, with loss, they lose their homes, they lose family members. Is it possible here to enter a state of surrender? Uh, is it possible to accept the seemingly unacceptable? Oh. And for some people it has been possible. I know it is possible to accept what seems unacceptable. And if you accept mm. the unacceptable, you will go very deep, very quickly. And what otherwise would take many years of realization to realize, it will take you to a very deep point if you accept something, great loss in your life. In prison, I continuously get letters from people in prison now. This is unacceptable. Some prisons are dreadful places. And some people there live in agony and suffering and anger and resentment. And some, a minority, a few, have realized that they can live in the state of inner surrender, which is not negative. It's a complete acceptance that this is as it is right now. Because they are in non-resistance, non-judgment, and non-attachment. Yes, because, yeah. and you accept it because, why should you accept it? Because it is at this moment. Mm -hmm. It is. So well, no matter what it is, accepting the isness of this moment brings you to a place of inner freedom and also a place of power. Mm. Go, you have to go, to, in order to accept the unacceptable, you have to go really very deep and say, very, bring a very deep yes to this moment, mm -hmm. an uncompromising yes. I think that a lot of people have trouble with the word accepting it because yes. accepting says to people, I must then also condone it. No. What you're saying is stop, den by your term accept, you mean don't deny that it's happening. Yes. As you resist it, if you continue to resist it, the example you used earlier in, in our classes is you're, you're, you're in the mud, you're stuck in the mud, the wheels are in the mud, you must first accept that I'm stuck in the mud before you can get yourself out of the mud. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can't keep saying I'm not in the mud. No. Or you, and you don't say, I shouldn't be, why did this happen to me? I can't believe I'm in the mud. And, and then all the energy goes into the complaining and into the resistance. Correct. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Got it. Christina lives in Toronto, Canada, and Skyping us from her family room. Christina, your question. Hello. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Akbar. Hi. Hi. Um, I uh, have been afraid to drive for about 16 years now. I was in a serious car accident, and um, it has stopped me from, from you know, being responsible in my family life. My husband has so much burden. He has to take our kids to their activities and, and, and so forth, take time off of work to take them to doctor's appointments. So my question is, uh, but just recently from reading A New Earth, I, um, I've started to drive. So yay. Uh, but uh, my question is, how do I remain in the inner uh, spaciousness that you speak about on page 238 uh, so that I can stay behind the wheel? I mean, things are going well right now, but if that uh, fear um, comes creeping back, how do I handle it? I don't know if I want you behind the wheel if I'm on the road and you try oh, to do that. don't say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the uh, first, the, you are now able to drive. That's wonderful. The the old fear is gone, but now a new new fear has arisen, and that fear is about whether the fear is going to come back or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so that is often the case. People develop a fear about a fear. Mm -hmm. Where is it going? Am I going to be in fear again? The mind tends to do that kind of thing because it projects itself into the future and says, am I going to remain fearless or is mm -hmm. the fear going to come back? So realize that that is your mind trying to figure something out and thereby creating a new level of fear on, the, on top of the original fear that has already dissolved. So trust that it's not going to come back, but something you can do to help it is to actually consciously enjoy the driving and enjoy sitting in the car, mm -hmm. enjoy sitting at the traffic light, enjoy the driving itself. It, um, I enjoy driving. It's, it's a very peaceful thing to do for me. 
So, and be comfortable with being in the car. And uh, what I used to do often in the, don't do it so much anymore, I would get into my car and drive out to some lonely place and mm -hmm. sit in the car and meditate or write. I liked being in the car. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, use the enjoyment. The more you find the enjoyment, the less likely the fear is going to come back. So seek the enjoyment of, it is to do with enjoying the present moment, the driving itself, the movement, and so on. And don't go into your mind, don't follow up that thought when it says, oh, is it going to last? Is this state of be, being without fear going to last? To stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. Mm -hmm. The more you're in the moment, the less likely fear is going to come back. It can't really come back when you're in the now. Mm -hmm. It's only when you leave the now, then it'll come back. Either you go into the past, and you remember something that happened in the past, you, mm -hmm. you've left the now, or you go into the future and say, am I going to have fear again at some point? <laughs> so st the more you stay in the now, the more you're keeping out fear. Fear comes through past or future. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Yvonne. Hey, Yvonne. Okay. Yes. Hi. What's your um, question? I like this question. It's about this too shall pass and um, the quote about it. Um, forget the quote name. Shoot. Um, how do you be a voice for uh, change in the planet where things are going wrong and still be present in the stillness and create the action without being taken down by all the horrendous things that are happening? It seems to me like a paradox to be yeah. present and then to work for change in the future. Yeah, you said, how can I be a voice for planetary change and really say I don't mind what happens because there's so much. I don't mind what happens. That's yeah, what so much happens. crazy stuff is going on in the world. How can you just say? Do not mind uh, animal abuse. Right. All that. Not mind animal abuse. Not mind all the violence going on in the world and just say this too shall pass. First, of course, um, the English language has two expressions that are related and yet very different. Sometimes. Uh, I don't mind is interpreted by people as meaning I don't care. Mm -hmm. so I don't care and I don't mind are very different. I don't mind does not mean that you don't care. It means there is a space of freedom inside you mm -hmm. and that is a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. And unless you are rooted in that peaceful place within, you cannot ultimately be an agent for true positive change in this world. Your state of consciousness is what transmits itself through whatever you do. Mm -hmm. Your state of consciousness is primary. Mm -hmm. And only if your state of consciousness is at peace can whatever you do reflect that. And you can be a bringer of peace into this violent and insane world. And you can then, through whatever you do externally, can bring sanity into this logic, insane world. Whether it's about that particular thing you're, you're concerned about or not, because if you are in a state of consciousness where you are at peace, everything that you do in the world will bring peace to the world. Yes. And that's how you change the world. Yes. And everything you, will do, you do will be much more empowered. It will be empowered by that consciousness rather than coming from antagonism, coming from thinking I have to fight these people, making situations or people into enemies. That's all the old consciousness. You cannot change this world through the old consciousness or applying the structures and the ways of the old consciousness. Yeah, one of the things you shared with us earlier, uh, what he was saying, Yvonne, in one of the early classes, is that you cannot uh, make change by fighting against anything. And a surefire way of knowing that something is going to fail is when you say it's the war against. Yes. The war against anything yeah. cannot win. No. So if you cannot fight, it does not mean that you cannot take action. You can take powerful action, but it comes out of that ba basic place of inner peace. Uh, people don't realize, many people don't realize yet that very powerful action ca come out of the place of inner peace. Mm -hmm.
They believe they need to be agitated to bring about change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coming from inner peace motivate other people to sort of mind what's going on so that they might do things differently in their lives that impact the planet as a whole. That's the thing that kind of worries me, that the concept can give people apathy and like, oh, I'm going to throw my cigarette on the ground and it's going to go into the ocean and I don't mind what happens. That, that's no, that's not it. You see the consequences of any action. If you're present, then you, you will not do unconscious things that will that actually produce suffering. It's only when you're not present that you will produce suffering in one form right. or another. Got that. When you're present, you, can, you, do not, you do not generate suffering for yourself or others. It's the only place from where you don't generate suffering. And then you're already, you're, you are already the beginning of the change of the world. And then it doesn't matter what you do, you may just disseminate information. But the information about, to make people aware of certain things, some people, this can be a very important thing to do. And the way in which you disseminate the information will also be empowered by your state of consciousness. It will, will not make others wrong, other people wrong, and thereby produce a reaction. And then you're trapped in the same old thing. You've experienced that, right, Yvonne? You've been on the street or okay. some, and somebody is trying to hand out something, and if it's a person who's really agitated or you can feel or sense their anger and agitation, you don't want to take the pamphlet. But if the person hands it to you or whatever it is with a, you know, with, a, with, a calm, with a sense of calm or peace, then you're more inclined to want to even engage with them? Yeah. I've experienced that as myself like 15 years ago in college, being the staunch environmentalist and telling people what to do. And, of course, watching them do the opposite, yeah. and inspiring the exact opposite that I wanted. So I've worked the last 10 years since the power of the now to be present. But in order to do that, I had to, like, stop looking at the atrocities of the world. And now I'm ready to come back and I want to keep the spiritual side but at the same time not let the world get me down but be able to yes. do something and be a part of positive change. Yes, that's your challenge now. Your that's right. your challenge now and your spiritual practice now is to balance the two so that you can be active and bring about change in the world without losing your rootedness in being and your presence. So that's a balancing a balancing yeah. act. Yes. And that's what you have Thank to do you now. For sharing. Thank How you. To do it. It, I'm learning slowly what you just said about accepting the acceptance, the deep acceptance of the, the world as it is. That hit me. Yeah. Finally, I'm starting to understand the depth. Yeah. And not the accept of it's okay. No. Right. Just that it, this is happening. That it is happening. Yes. Yes. And that the oh, angrier you and more upset you, uh, you get about it, it's still happening. Oh, yeah. 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 That doesn't serve anything. I get that. But then how do you keep going? But I'm... It's a slow process. There's two more weeks, two more chapters, <laughs> I'm hoping. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Inner Purpose yeah. is going to help that a lot. Yes. Thank you. Tell Nick yeah. to be sure to show up for Inner Purpose. i got a few things to say. To <laughs> 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 Thanks, everybody. Uh, Natalie lives in Australia but is on holiday with her family and is Skyping us from her friend's kitchen in England. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Hi. Hi. How are you? Yeah, we're both well. Thank Good. you. This is so exciting for me. Um, on page 239 in your book, um, you say that some people feel more alive when they travel and visit unfamiliar places or foreign countries because those times sense perceptions, experiencing, take up more of their consciousness than thinking. Uh, since the class on the third chapter, I've been sharing an amazing holiday with my family and our friends to Europe. Um, I've been able to enjoy my holiday so much more by practicing the teachings that I've read about in the book and the things I've learned from the class. Uh, but my life back home is not like my holiday. It's really busy. I've got a job and three children and my husband has his own, his own business. And on reflection, I think I've filled up any free time I've had so that I wasn't alone with that constant noise in my head. I feel really great at the moment and I want to feel the same when I go home. So my question is, how do I transition between this wonderful holiday and go back to my normal life at home? Okay, okay. That's a good question. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, it's a good question. The, the everydayness of uh, many people's lives can really 
pull you into a place of unconsciousness because of the repetitiveness of mm -hmm. one's life. So it's up to you when you get home to uh, bring a, to invite a different state of consciousness as much as possible into your daily life, into the daily routine of your life. Invite a state of presence when you are engaged in things that you do every day repetitively, things that usually are a means to an end, mm -hmm. driving the kids to school, going, doing the shopping, doing, uh, you can see how many things are a means to an end in one's daily existence. And that's not a very uh, powerful way to live when almost everything you do in your daily existence is a means to some end because you want to, like, right. you have to do this and this, have to. So bring in presence where instead of, of treating whatever you do as a means to an end, as much as possible, make it into an end in itself. For example, when you're driving from here to there, be absolutely present every moment. Look around, be alert as if you were seeing things for the first time. Mm -hmm the trees, the people, the traffic. And you do that by not labeling things. Not labeling mentally mm -hmm. what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Be there as, as a conscious presence when you're doing shopping at the supermarket. Uh, most perceiving without naming is Perceiving what without naming. Be there with every step. Look at the things around you. What do I need to get? To be conscious of every movement, of everything around you, so that it's not an everyday thing, it's that everything that you do is happening just now. It's not yeah. a repetition. That's and, I, and I promise you, if you, if you start to do this in your everyday life, what he says on page uh, 252, as much as possible in everyday life, use awareness of the inner body to start to create space. Um, when waiting, when listening to someone, when pausing to look at the sky, all on page 252, a tree, a flower, your partner, a child, Feel the aliveness within at the same time. This means part of your attention or consciousness remains formless and the rest is available for the outer world of form. Whenever you inhabit your body in this way, it serves as an anchor for staying present in the now, prevents you from losing yourself in thinking, in emotions, or in external situations. When you really get that, what he's saying on page 252, Natalie, everything around you takes on a magical quality. I, I can really testify to that that just doing yeah. routine things becomes almost like you have wow moments doing the smallest things, you know, washing I've the... Been feeling it. Yeah. I've been feeling that at the moment because we've been seeing so many amazing things and meeting so many different people and being in places where they speak different languages. But I know at home what I do is that when I'm doing something, I'm thinking about the next thing that I'm going to be doing. The next so I, I really need to, um, I can really take that on. Thank you what so much. What I would like to say to you and everybody else, when you start to put this into practice, and I've been doing it myself during the past eight weeks, when you start to actually put it into practice, everything is amazing. Yes. Everything <clears throat> starts to be amazing. The fact that you're breathing in and out of your lungs starts to be amazing. That's what the now does. It brings you... To, to, a, to a level of consciousness and presence. So just being is amazing. And you don't have to leave home to experience that. Isn't that the, that's the, that's that's right. the key? Isn't yes, it? that's isn't the key, it? yes. What is on the backboard? I thought I saw my name there when there was a wide shot there. Does that say Oprah? That's from my, it does. That's from my Georgie. She's asleep because it's about 3 a.m. But she wanted to say hi, so that's her hi, Oprah. Hi, Georgie. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. But that's the Bye. Whole, thank you. Yes. What Natalie was talking about yes. is the whole point of awakening to your life's purpose. And next week we're going to be talking about inner purpose, yes. which is what I was trying to say to Nick, um, uh, maybe too stridently. <laughs> that has happened a couple times where I'm like saying to Gail, Gail will say, I don't understand. I'll go, well, the reason is... Um, well, Nick represents about uh, 50 million other people who are the same. That's uh, right, yeah. who are feeling that, well, listen, I got to make money. Yeah. I got to make money. But what we're going to be talking about next week, Nick, <laughs> is when you align the inner purpose 
and let the inner purpose determine what your outer actions are, yes. then you're not worried. That's right. You never worry. Yes. No matter how much money you're making. Yes. You're not worried because you're on purpose with your life. Yeah. You're on purpose with your life. Yeah, well, you know, I think a lot of people feel like this is all kind of, sometimes they feel like this is ooey gooey stuff. And yes, and I'll get spiritual, but let me make some money first. <laughs> yeah. I want to yes. be spiritual and all that, yeah. but I got to make some money first. Yeah, that's yeah. actually the, in, the, in, the Gos, in the New Testament where he says, let me first do this, they, they invite you to the kingdom of heaven. That's and right. They, well, let me first do this, with another, well, there's another excuse, let me first do this, first I have to do this, yes. and then I'll be ready. Uh -huh. Of course, it never happens. The that's then, right. The then never comes. So uh, there is Barbara in Shanghai, China, who writes, I find it really difficult to be the observer of a challenging work environment, especially when I'm frustrated with employees and have to discipline my staff. What are some of the practical steps I can take to overcome the situation? Well, there you use whatever the practical things that are described in the book, mm -hmm. uh, conscious, uh, one or two conscious breaths as mm -hmm. often as possible, getting in touch with the feeling of the inner body, the aliveness of the inner body, while you are listening to people, especially, mm -hmm. then already a different energy is there. You are listening from a different state of consciousness when you are in touch with the inner body while you listen. Right. And a lot of things, uh, a, a person who is uh, running an office or whatever the, our yes. questioner does, they probably have to deal with many people every day, which involves listening to people in addition to, of course, speaking to people. Mm -hmm. So be there as the, feel the aliveness within as you listen, as much as possible, take conscious breaths while you are engaged in things. That's right. Bringing, bringing spaces, little spaces into your daily existence. Gaps. Little gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, that is more important than doing, a, it's, it's wonderful to do a meditation at the end of the day, mm -hmm. but bringing little gaps I into your everyday activities mm -hmm. is even more important. I love what you talk mm -hmm. about on page 232 and 233. You tell people to avoid watching television programs and commercials that assault you with a rapid succession of images that change every two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than watching at random, choose the programs you want to see. Whenever you remember to do so, feel the aliveness also inside your body as you watch. Alternatively, be aware of your breathing from time to time, looking away from the screen at regular intervals so that it doesn't completely take possession of your visual sense. We just did a show the other day, um, and this mom, it was a show about giving up what you could, what you could be willing to live without, and this family was going to give up their computers, or they did give up their computers and their televisions for a week, and their little five-year-old boy was crying because he had to give up the computer. His mom walked in the room, stood behind him, was behind him, called his name, and he still couldn't, he couldn't hear her because he was so mesmerized by the video game he was playing. What are we doing to ourselves, and more importantly, to our children, through the video games, the, the television, which is, 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 is a form of, like, hypnosis almost yes. for people? Yes. And it, it pulls your attention out of the body. It's like a leaking, an energy leakage, mm -hmm. when, especially for young children, mm -hmm. when uh, the energy gets drawn out very easily. And uh, so it's continuous uh, energy leakage, and they cannot focus on, on, because of the rapidly changing images on TV screen for in many programs, uh, the ability to, to to have a prolonged focus on something is greatly diminished. Well, I thought that. That's why we have so many children with ADD, because they've grown up in a world where they can only, there's 30 seconds and 30 seconds yes. and 30 seconds. Yes. That uh, means the quality of your life is also diminished, because the quality of your life very much depends on th the degree of your attention. Mm -hmm. At attention mm -hmm. is quality. So if you, can, if you cannot give attention to anything for very long, that diminishes the quality of your life and what you can do. So parents need to be careful with their children. I'm not saying remove all these things immediately from your children because <coughs> they are addictive, yeah. but very gently um, d don't reduce the amount of time they spend 
with video games and the reduce gently the amount of time you spend watching television. Because they cause you, as you say, so when watching television, the tendency is for you to fall below thought, not rise above it. Television has this in common with alcohol and certain other drugs. While it provides some relief from your mind, you again pay a high price, loss of consciousness. Yes. And here we have... Well, that's the... what it's designed to do, isn't it, for the most part? Yes, it's... Uh, <laughs> here we Our have... show, though, is designed to make you more conscious. I will have to say that. I know that. When I wrote, there somewhere, there are some television shows that have been helpful to many people and have raised people's consciousness. It says that somewhere in the mm -hmm. book. It does. I saw you, you in my mental, in my really? mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You could have just said, oh, the Oprah show. <laughs> I saw you wrote that there are some television shows. You could have just put in parentheses, the Oprah show, for example. Yes. So, and, yeah, but for the most part, television is designed to numb us out. Yes. And here <laughs> we have the interesting uh, concept of... Um, Go, arising above thinking and falling below thinking. So what we are engaged in here, now most people are at the thinking level, they mm -hmm. are controlled by their mind, they are identified with their mind. Mm -hmm. This work that we are doing here, if you can call it work, it's not work really, no. <laughs> um, is rising above thinking. Mm -hmm. being, being present mm -hmm. means you have risen above thinking. You are fully conscious, but there's little or no thought activity. Can you tell me why you say on page 233, make sure you don't go to sleep immediately after switching off the set, or even worse, fall asleep with the set still on? I know my friend Gail sometimes is watching TV and she goes, I don't know if I was watching or my feet were watching because she goes to sleep with the TV on. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then the, all the, the turmoil that you've just been watching and you've just spent a, a, a significant amount of time below thought mm -hmm. in a state of unawareness and unconsciousness and if you go from that will af affect the quality of your sleep and you will notice also when you wake up in the morning you won't be as refreshed it's it's vital to go into sleep from a place of consciousness mm -hmm. rather than unconsciousness then the quality of your sleep will be much better and you will wake up feeling I renewed I that See, I don't watch television before going to bed, hardly watch television at all, but I notice that if I meditate before going to sleep, I have a better sleep. Yes. And what I recommend to people is, as they lie in bed, uh, ready to go to sleep, uh, lie on your back, flat on your back, and bring attention, scan your body with your attention, mm -hmm. from your feet to your head, mm -hmm. your hands, your arms, and then feel the... In the internal aliveness of the body as you lie there. You lie in the energy field of your body. That means there's also very little or no thinking going That's on right. because the attention moves into the body. Into the body. And there, from there, you go to sleep. Hold that for five, ten minutes. It's a very pleasant way of, of, of saying goodbye to that day and of mm -hmm. going into sleep. It feels very much alive. It's, it's joyful, actually, to, to lie there in, the, in that energy field. And that energy field that you're talking about is exactly what this whole chapter is about, is the energy field of inner space. Yes. Go inside the body yes. and allow yourself to be the observer of the body. Yes. And be in, then you connect with the energy. You merge the energy field. And, of course, the body is mostly empty space, 99.999% empty space. Physicists tell us mm -hmm. the space between the molecules, the atoms that make up the body, the spaces in between the atoms is so vast that your body is 99.999% empty space. <laughs> That's a, that's a lot for my brain to take in right now. <laughs> but I do want to thank you for uh, joining us. This eighth class will be available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. And if you want to download or watch any of our classes, you can do that tomorrow also at Oprah.com and iTunes. It's free because of the generous support of Nature Made Soft Gel Vitamins. This week, you can update your workbook. Get ready for our next class, Chapter 9. We're coming to the end. Your inner purpose your inner purpose. For all of you who've read this book looking for your inner purpose, this is what it's all about, people. Thank you. Thank you. For bringing us into inner space. Next week is inner purpose. And as I was saying to Nick earlier, inner purpose, when it defines 
what you do in the world, put you in alignment, and all things come. Yes. As they should. And then it comes the alignment of inner purpose and outer purpose. Ah, uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good Let's night. do our high five. We almost didn't do it last oh. week, and people complained. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.